Good day, everybody, and welcome to Seed Speaks. My name is Mark Zinkowitz, and I am an editor with Seed World Group. And today we are talking with a couple of experts about the issue of workplace safety in an age of public health restrictions and guidelines, with a focus on safety in the lab, be it your own lab or labs you may be visiting. I'm joined today by Jennifer Scott, Programs Manager for Seeds Canada, who is based in London, Ontario, and Amanda Verhelst, Director of Operations for SGS, based in Brookings, South Dakota. Welcome to the both of you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of this topic, I would just like to learn a little bit about each of you. Jennifer, let's start with you. Who is Jennifer Scott and what does she do at Seeds Canada? Uh, actually, today I'm celebrating my 24 years of working uh, in the Canadian seed industry. I started in August of 1997. So I'm the manager of client programs with Seeds Canada, which means I'm responsible for the oversight of the seed program that we deliver on behalf of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the uh, identity preservation and food safety programs that we deliver on behalf of the Canadian Grain Commission, and also the organic certification program that we deliver on behalf of another part of um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So I'm responsible for program development, coming up with the tools that the auditors and inspectors use um, in terms of forms and policy. And I also have overall responsibility for the training of um, all of our auditors and inspectors across Canada. And how about you, Amanda? What does your job entail at SGS? So I'm the Director of Operations here at our uh, Crop Science Facility in Brookings, South Dakota. Uh, we are the only U.S. crop science location. Um, we actually house the world's largest independent seed testing laboratory where we look at uh, seed germination measurements, vigor, purity, um, specific traits in seed, and many other, other metrics that are used to measure seed quality. Um, we also have an analytical chemistry laboratory where we analyze components of grain, feed, and other commodities. We are a high throughput laboratory here in Brookings. We have about 68,000 square feet. Um, we employ about 100 to 130 full-time people, uh, depending on the time of year. Uh, we do have seasonal positions available in the fall too, to uh, work with our really busy workload. So we depend on our staff to be on site to run the analysis. Um, obviously in a laboratory situation, you have to have staff on site to run those analysis. Um, our laboratory is split into separate spaces here at our facility. So we have separate lab spaces for each operation and the employees report to that one um, space on a daily basis. Now I'd like to know how your work lives have changed since this thing called COVID-19 entered our lives about a year and a half ago. Starting with you, Jennifer, how did your work change when, when all of this first started? Can you sort of describe for us uh, your first memory of, of that and, and how things have progressed uh, to, to, to where you are today in terms of how your life, uh, your work life works right now? Sure. Uh the day that the WHO declared uh, COVID-19 a pandemic, uh, I was on my way home from Winnipeg, um, traveling on the airplane, having just finished a, a seed grader course. I teach um, between four and six of those across the country normally every year. Uh, so as I was coming home, I was um, buying hand sanitizer in the airport because that was already in short supply here in Ontario. Um, and that was the last trip I took uh, until, you know, late August um, of last year uh, when there was a bit of a lull in cases. And I went to, I took the train to Quebec, actually. Um, so my job has been remote uh, for probably um, 22 years. I, after I moved to London, Ontario, my job came with me and I've been working remotely ever since. Uh, half of our staff at the time were also remote. So we had a small office staff um, and, and the other half of us were working remotely. So we shifted like everybody else to working um, 
uh, remotely all the time. We were all able to work remotely as our as our core staff. Uh, it also required that uh, we had to change how audits and inspections were done because those are all done typically in person. Um, so we uh, put a big pause on that uh, last spring. So in you know March, April, May of 2020 to figure out what to do. And how about you, Amanda? How has your life and job changed over the course of the last year and a half or so? Um, you know, we had a lot of right away when it first started, there was a lot of concerns. Obviously, we couldn't move our staff to work remote. So we had to address that situation at hand. Um, we, we really looked to see what jobs we could move remote to keep our staff as safe as possible. So we analyzed each individual role we have here. Uh, those We had some office jobs that we did end up moving remote for a while. We took a really hard look at our staff and where the needs are, um, what would happen if there was a, an outbreak in our lab, um, and where what, what we would need to do in that situation. Um, we actually ended up splitting our staff into uh, two separate shifts. So the separate shifts didn't have access to each other. So if we did have an outbreak on one shift, hopefully we would have another shift to um, compensate for that. So there was a lot of uh, navigating, actually navigating work life, family balance. Um, we had upset schedules of people, schools were shut down, we had to navigate that with some of our employees, you know, they had to be allowed the flexibility to manage their personal schedules as well during that time. Um, so we had to allow that, um, but we had to keep our business open and operating at full capacity. So we really had to look at that situation and try to be proactive on the things we could do to stay ahead of it. Well, and Amanda, you just touched on uh, my next question, actually. Obviously, today's discussion is about safety in a lab environment. And you mentioned you were wrestling with this question of, well, what happens if there's an outbreak in our lab? How can we keep people safe? How do we keep people healthy? Now, obviously, you had to develop a, a plan for how mm -hmm. to keep people in, in your lab safe. What were some of those major safety considerations for you in developing that plan? And, and what were some of the major challenges you faced in trying to figure that out? Yeah. So, you know, SGS is a global company. So we also have the luxury of having, uh, you know, an entire team to, uh, that can look at these things. We have a crisis management team that we put into place at the beginning of this. So we had assistance from our corporate team on helping us here at our, our individual sites. But really what we did is we took a hard look at our business and where the holes would have been if we would have had an outbreak, what we would have had to do in that situation. So we looked at that and how to how to mitigate that the best we could. Um, we started by you know following all of the CDC guidelines, the measures they had put in place. Um, we we like I said, we split our staff into two shifts. Um, we we took a look at the daily traffic patterns in our laboratory where our personnel were moving around. Um, tried to mitigate that. Try, uh, we made sign out sheets so we could easily track um, if we did have an outbreak. That was one of the things we needed to do is to make sure that if we had a positive case, we could contact trace, track that immediately and mitigate it as much as possible. Hopefully, you know, that wouldn't affect more employees. Um, we had put mask mandates in place. We actually started doing daily temperature monitoring. Um, you know, there was an, inc an incredible amount of encouragement um, by management to make sure our staff understood this, the, uh, the direness of the situation that if there was any illness at all that they were to stay home you know we offered some additional benefits to aid in that as well and that's something that sometimes you need to look at too um you have to have that in place to allow the employees that flexibility in those situations um and you know we looked at things like if one department had an outbreak what would we do how would we compensate to uh you know to get through that time when we had people out um we had to look at that as well and to see what we would do and always try to be proactive on if there was a crisis, what's the worst case scenario that could happen and what would we do if that did happen and try to be proactive and stay ahead of it. And, and uh, it really did help us out in the long run. 
Now, Jennifer, you mentioned that you've been doing remote inspections for for the last number of months, and you're slowly starting to move back now to doing some some in person inspections. What have been the major safety considerations for you now that you're slowly but surely moving back to to doing some in person inspections? What's what's top of mind for for you right now, and how do you navigate that? Uh, Amanda mentioned flexibility. So flexibility uh, remains one of the most important things we have to keep in mind. Like I mentioned, um, we uh, conduct business across Canada. That means that you're dealing with um, provincial health regulations uh, in a lot of different jurisdictions. In Ontario, we're split into public health units. So each public health unit can operate as its own um, entity and have its own requirements. So our instructions to our auditors and inspectors in the beginning, and those remain in place, was to um, uh, be mindful of what's required of you by law, uh, where you're working. Uh, if you're going to go on site, uh, you have to be comfortable with it and your client has to be comfortable with it. Some companies have a policy of not allowing any uh, anyone who's not an employee on the premises that has to be respected. Uh, some people have uh, personal issues, um, health concerns, uh, receiving cancer treatment, who knows what. Uh, so the work, the work can be carried out uh, with a, a high degree of rigor remotely. So we're, we're able to do, um, and a little to my surprise, because I wasn't sure how this would all work out in the beginning, but we are able to carry out very effective audits and inspections, uh, mostly remotely. Um, for our organic program, of course, we have had to uh, look at fields in person, but that's an outdoor activity. So we were able to do that even last year um, when things were more restrictive. Uh, I myself have done um, three or four lab audits uh, remotely. So making use of the technology tools that we have um, uh, that facilitate that. And depending on how things progress, dealing with a fourth wave, um, how that's affecting different people across the country, uh, that remote option is going to remain viable for the foreseeable future. I'm going to take a moment to take a question from our audience. Have you found that these new procedures you've developed have helped to cut down on sick time and employees getting colds and other illnesses? And do you plan to keep them in place in the future? So J Jennifer, sticking with what you were saying earlier, you mentioned that being able to do things remotely has been a big help to you in, in a lot of ways. And so do you plan to, to keep that around? And, and, and how has that maybe benefited your operations by maybe you know cutting down on sick time and things like that? Uh, personally, I haven't been sick in uh, a year and a half. It's been amazing what wearing a mask and washing your hands obsessively can do for you. Uh, the, I find with remote um, audits and inspections, um, I'm able to do more uh, in a broader geographic area than I would be, of course, if I had to travel. Uh, you, you know um, from your own experience that when you travel, you lose a day getting to some place, uh, you lose a day going home. Uh, so you oftentimes, if you're trying to group things together, you lose a whole week of, of time. Whereas I was able to do witness audits, um, do audits myself, uh, participate in meetings, uh, all in the same week uh, with people in a wide geographic area that I would never be able to do on my own. Um, so it's that I can easily see there being a component of remote activity that becomes a permanent part of our of our job. You can't do it all remotely all the time, certainly not when we're talking about audits and inspections. There are times when you have to be there physically, but there is a lot of room for remote um, activity as well. Amanda, how about you? How have what have been some of the benefits of these these increased safety protocols that you've implemented in the lab, and and do you plan to keep some of those even after we've turned the corner on this whole pandemic thing? 
Um, yeah, and I would agree with Jennifer too. You know, we did see a significant decrease in in sicknesses across the board as far as that goes um, with our employees throughout the year. Um, and we do plan to keep some of our uh, plan uh, of the the processes in place that we have here. Um, you know, the as Jennifer mentioned, we did transfer a lot of our communication to our clients and um, the meetings that we were doing outside of our local our location, we transferred a lot of that virtually as well. And, and there is a cost and time saving in that, um, as she mentioned, that we will probably continue on as well, because there was, you know, there was a big shift and there was a change and, and it was noticed that, hey, some of these things are more uh, productive to do virtually. So, you know, there, there will be processes that I think, you know, the virtual platform is going to continue to grow. And um, I think that that is something that's going to stay in place in the future. Now, before we wrap up for the day, I want to give our viewers some strategies that they can use to develop a workplace safety plan of their own. Amanda, when you sat down to develop a formal plan, what were the major things you had to consider and, and what are some potential pitfalls that you would advise people to watch out for? Yeah, um, so when we sat down to do it, we really had to look at the business and the roles that we had here and where our risks were. Where was the biggest risk to our business if we would have an outbreak? And that's where we started and in, in to manage it. Um, we looked at who could work outside the office? How could we mitigate this as much as possible by just doing simple things like letting people work from home or you know, splitting up the staff? Uh, we looked for where there were holes, where areas that couldn't be covered if there was, would have been an outbreak. That was the, that was the areas we addressed first. Um, you look at you know, if there's ways you can space out your processes and staff. Um, and, and really, we just really took a hard look every day of, okay, this is the situation we're in now. What if tomorrow we have an outbreak? What would we do then? And every day we address that and just try to be as proactive as possible, um, constantly looking at that worst case scenario and how we would mitigate it. What small steps we could do each day to help make it less severe or manageable if we did have an outbreak. And along with that, you have to remember to allow the employees flexibility and grace through these situations because you have to understand each individual navigates these in a different manner. Um, they have, you know, their family, uh, whatever else is going on in their life that makes these di these situations differ for each individual and you have to remember and respect that. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges we had was making sure that we maintain that flexibility um, and that with our employees while still maintaining the uh, severity of the situation and making sure that everybody was following those policies and procedures. Jennifer, how about you? How did you go about developing a formal plan and what would you advise people to, to watch out for as, as they sit down to, to make one of these plans themselves? In the beginning, um, we, we belong to different um, groups of uh, certifiers and audit bodies. Uh, and we looked to our colleagues um, because we were all in the same boat. Everybody was struggling to try to figure out how we were going to do what up until March of 2020 had been a very in-person activity. I mean, nobody ever had remote audits or inspections. Uh, and how we were going to continue to uh, verify compliance to standards and regulations um, when not we weren't able to be on site. So I participated in a lot of um, dialogue and discussions, as did my colleagues, uh, to try to formulate um, some plans uh, we came up with, uh, you know, some tools to um, record, you know, like we, so we asked our auditors and inspectors to have a meeting ahead of the audit to lay the groundwork out with the client, um, asking for some documents in advance, um, going over the technology requirements, seeing what the client is capable of using. Not everybody is comfortable with every single uh form of uh, meeting communication that's out there. So you have to be, again, flexible um, to be able to use whatever tool uh, the client is, is able to handle. Um, in some cases, that meant, you know, doing, doing the audit um, at a, a picnic table outside, you know, six feet apart because the client uh, didn't 
use the internet at all. Um, so we've we've given people lots of choices as to how to how to you know communicate, whether it's Zoom or FaceTime or uh, Teams or whatever. We weren't overly concerned about um, the you know like being hacked or something like that. That hasn't happened. Um, our the work we do is relatively low risk, and when it comes to that kind of thing, uh, so lots of choice. Um, again, lots of flexibility. Some uh, you know forms that we altered to remove the need, for example, of signatures. You know, a lot of our business is so reliant, has been up until now, on signatures, and uh, I doubt we're going to go back to getting somebody to sign a piece of paper because it's just not necessary. And we didn't want to be passing pens and paper back and forth. So it's a lot of little things like that that have made a huge difference and have pushed us into improving our processes internally to accommodate some of these changes that were probably ready to be made anyway. This was just the push we needed. Yeah, there's so much to consider when it comes to workplace safety at the best of times, never mind during a pandemic. But thankfully, we have this great thing called technology to to help us along the way. So thank you both for your insights today. That's all the time we have on today's episode of Seed Speaks. If you missed part of today's live stream, don't worry, we'll have it available on demand via Facebook and YouTube and on our Seed World Group websites as well. If you have any questions about this topic or ideas for future topics that you think we should tackle, simply message us via social media or through the contact information on our websites. Amanda and Jennifer, thanks so much for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for joining in. Have a wonderful day, everybody. This is Mark Zinkowitz of Seed World Group signing off.